Um, if I could call upon uh, the panelists for the next uh, session, the media content. We're having a brief uh, five-minute recess to allow for the panelists to come up. And we'll be finishing early because there'll be a security sweep before the opening, official opening. So if I could call upon all the media content panelists, and if the remote moderators, Mr. Mamadoulou, and Adama Jallo, if you could please uh, stop streaming, just so we can have the technical uh, aspects out of the way. And if I could kindly ask the uh, WebEx uh, coordinator to please prepare our panelists who are streaming in from Miami, Florida, just to be ready to hook her up. So with that, thank you. We'll be starting shortly in four minutes. Thank you. And uh, testing to see if there's anyone from the IGF Secretariat in Sale 1, just to put the name cards, please, on the, the table. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you announce this in Spanish? Announce it in Spanish. We're about to start in three minutes' time. Yeah? And that will be covering the following public policy issues. Just announce it in Spanish. Apreciados amigos, en pocos minutos estaremos empezando la sesión principal sobre medios y contenidos. Les pedimos su atención con relación a las preguntas de políticas públicas que tienen que ver con eh, el, el tema central de nuestra, de nuestra sesión. Muchas gracias. So I'm going to make an announcement in Chinese, okay? So, uh, three minutes after, we will this section, will, is this lecture will start. Uh, please prepare. Three minutes after, thank you. Hello, um, I'm just going to make an announcement in Urdu. Uh, we log going to start in five minutes. In this session, we are um, media regulation and news media and fake news topics. Ko jo hai, cover karenge.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to uh, commence the media content uh, main session. The working title of today's main session is Media as a Cornerstone for Peace, the Assault on Media Freedom and Freedom of Expression. We're very privileged this uh, morning to have uh, quite a distinguished panel, one of whom uh, is not able to be here because uh, she happens to be an expert witness in a death penalty case, and she's been subpoenaed. But thankfully, thanks to technology, she'll be able to stream in through WebEx. We'd li also like to apologize for the brief, intermittent uh, lack of connectivity earlier this morning. We've been, we had a DDoS attack, I've been told. And uh, that just shows that the IGF is the place to be, that someone would want to bother to um, contain our capacity to express ourselves through the IGF. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is uh, Salanieta Tamanika Wamaro, and um, I'm your uh, chair and moderator for this particular main session. And I'd also like to introduce the remote moderators. Could the three remote moderators please stand up? Led by Dama Jalu, Mr. Mamadulu, and um, yes, and with us also um, is um, the panel. If I could just uh, get them to uh, uh, please stand up as I introduce them because of the lack of uh, uh, placards or name cards. So Ms. Shmaila Khan, she is from the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan. Privileged to have you here, Shmaila. We also have uh, Dr. Rasha Abdullah, who's a professor of journalism and mass communication from the American University at Cairo, in Cairo. Not too long ago, you remember, we had the Arab Spring in the Tunis Square, and so we'll be looking at some really interesting, uh, at the evolution of media and content. And then also we have um, Ms. Anki Das, who happens to be the director of public policy in Facebook. We also have uh, Mr. Giacomo Mazon, Buongiorno Giacomo, could you please stand up to let people see you? He's the head of institutional relations and he happens to represent the European Broadcasting Network Union and the World Broadcasting Union. The, uh, our remote participant or remote speaker is Professor Luz E. Nagel from the Stetson University College of Law. She was a former judge in Colombia. She had to flee because of death threats. Um, from some of the criminal trials that she headed. And now she's teaching law and she also happens to sit in uh, some of the distinguished committees in the International Bar Association. Very distinguished uh, expert. And we also have uh, none other than the lovely Dr. Yi Chen Ching. We're very privileged to have her here from China. She's a lecturer in Media and Communication Studies. I hope I pronounced this right. Apologize to all Chinese speakers if I mispronounce this. Jian Jiatong. Liverpool University, okay, she's smiling, so I must have said it right. So those are our speakers. What we'll be doing is, uh, instead of um, the panel talking down or talking uh, down to the uh, audience, we'll be engaging in a very interactive dialogue. Are we okay with that? And so we'd like you to participate in this uh, dynamic session, and it can only be dynamic if there's a two-way communication, which means feel free at any time to intervene, ask a question. We'll be canvassing some of the public policy issues, some public policy questions, and I'll just read out some of them. The first one is, is the media an appendage of established power? And is the media able to adequately act as a mechanism to keep gov governments and businesses accountable? What is the necessary policy environment to ensure media freedom? Is media freedom absolute, or are there limits to freedom of expression? What are some implications for abuses of freedom of expression and media freedom? Um, is there such a thing as responsible journalism and irresponsible journalism? And uh, instances of fake news? What are some best practices or code of conduct? Or does a code of conduct exist? What protections are available for media? How should it be protected? So what exactly is fake news? How should it be defined? Is it a pressing social problem that warrants government intervention? Is self-regulation instead the answer? 
Where do freedom of expression and press freedom fit into the equation? What are some policy controls to deal with fake news? What are the roles and responsibilities of government and other stakeholders like private sector, civil society, and individuals in ensuring media freedom and promoting responsible journalism, if responsible journalism is indeed a legitimate concept? And what are, some appropriate, or what are the appropriate international organizations, framework, and fora to tackle these issues? So with that, I would like to please invite uh, Professor Rasha Abdullah to start us off with uh, her perspective on some of these questions. So we'll be giving them three minutes each before we ask for intervention uh, from the community and also from the remote participants. So with that, thank you, Professor Rasha. Thank you, Sala. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be on this panel. Uh, these are a lot of questions that you just asked, uh, so I'll, I'll try to make just a few very brief points uh, in three minutes, if I if I can. Um, and I'll, I'll start with with a, f a few key things. I mean, can the media be a watchdog still, which is which is the function that we've kind of grew up knowing that the media should be doing, or is it now an appendage of those of in power? And I, I think the answer depends on, on the political system that you live in. So, um, you know, there are varying degrees of uh, freedom of expression all around the world. And obviously, the more a society enjoys uh, such freedom, the more the media can uh, do what it's supposed to be doing, which is, you know, which is act as a watchdog. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say, I think we're, we're witnessing a huge uh, crackdown on media freedoms all over the world, even in societies that we um, have sort of upheld to be more democratic than others. Uh, we're, we're seeing that come up, uh, you know, from, from the very top levels, from, you know, from those in power, from the heads of states. Uh, and, and that's something that we should all be really worried about, um, um, not just in the, in the societies that we know to be repressive, but actually in the societies that we know to be more democratic because that's a very slippery slope that, you know, once you get on, you can just lose it uh, very quickly. So that's one point that I think we should be, <coughs> we should all be wor very worried about. Um, the other thing that I'll introduce very quickly in my three minutes is um, a proposed definition of fake news, which I actually proposed uh, about a year and a half ago uh, at a workshop with the uh, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, David Kay. Uh, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, and I, I propose that we look at fake news to be something that at least have, has to have an intent to deceive. So it's not, you know, it's not a, a piece of news that had some kind of a, a reporter's mistake in it uh, that can be corrected by the news agency, but it's a, it's a news item that is meant to deceive, that has the intention to deceive. And the other thing is it should be of some consequence. So intent and consequence are basically my two, my two big things for me to consider something that, you know, worth discussing as an item of, of fake news. I think that uh, would, would give us some distinction from, you know, from um, the loads and, you know, the millions of tweets, for example, that, uh, that are posted every day to what we can pinpoint to actually hold somebody accountable um, if, they, if they do that. Um, all right, uh, I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. So whilst uh, Professor Russia has just uh, raised that, I thought we'd go to the crux of the role of media, which is essentially entertaining and providing an outlet for imagination. If you look at the history of media, it started off as entertainment, theater, and drama. And the second one being education and informing. The third one serving as a public forum for the discussion of important issues. The fourth one, acting as a watchdog for government, business, and other institutions, as uh, Professor Russia raised. Now, before we go to our next speaker, Giacomo Mazzone from the European Broadcasting Network, yesterday happened to be uh, World Armistice Day, right? World Armistice Day? And uh, if we look at when the allies of World War I in Germany, when they signed the armistice uh, in France, as the nation uh, commemorated Armistice Day and as we begin to celebrate the Paris uh, Peace Forum and as they're convening that. We look at how media was used here in Europe as a, propaganda, as a tool for propaganda. So with that, please let me uh, invite Mr. Giacomo Mazzoni to give his take. You have three minutes, Mr. Giacomo. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, 
the armistice is uh, the, the, the reason why the public broadcasting service exists in Europe. Um, as you probably know, historically, um, before the war, the, the state um, uh, television, radio at that time, uh, were the, the main tool for uh, creating hate and exciting country against another. And uh, at the end of the war, there was this agreement that uh, in Europe there will not be any more state broadcasting, but public service broadcasting. That means that there is a, a distinction between the state control and the independence of a broadcaster that can uh, structure the national debate in a way that is not dependent anymore from the government. And the, then there was the Cold War, a lot of other things happened, etc., etc. But today I think that we are again in a similar situation because we are uh, in a situation in which um, there is this discrepancy in society that has been caused by the digital transformation of society in which the, there is a refusal of mediators uh, and uh, there, uh, everything can see as can be said by everybody to everybody without any mediation. Um, we believe that this is um, profoundly wrong, uh, that a need for remediation still exists, and that uh, you don't go if you have a sickness uh, to somebody that is not a professional doctor. So I think that if you need to understand the world, you need professional mediations that can help you. Of course, uh, the, the difference between the previous system and the today's system is that uh, there is the interactivity. Once the broadcaster was one voice too many. Today, it's not anymore like this, and this is a big opportunity because you can interact directly with, with the, uh, the citizens, and you can get the feedback, and you can even develop cooperative and, and collaborative journalism and constructive journalism, a lot of other things that we are trying to, to do in order to intercept this change and to put for the good uh, of the society and for the... Uh, es essence of the f developing a society together. But the function of watchdog remain essential because um, a, a power that has no counter power uh, tends even with the better intention to abuse of his power. That's uh, quite normal in, in history we have seen. So the function of watchdog remain essential and essential to um, attach to this is the safety of the journalists because we know that the easiest way to, to short a debate, to cut short a debate is to kill the, the person that uh, is provoking that debate. So these are all linked together and I think that there is, we, we need to act simultaneously on the safety of journalists, that UNESCO is the house for this, um, to the watchdog function in the society and to strengthen even the business model of the media because at the moment it's uh, under very uh, huge pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giacomo. And with that, I'd like to ask um, the tech support team if they could please be ready to uh, broadcast uh, Professor Luz, who is streaming in from Miami. Luz, can you hear me? to the WebEx support team, just in case you didn't hear me. If you could please uh, put Luz up, Luz Nago. Okay, so whilst we're waiting for that, Mr. Mazone raised some very important uh, and interesting uh, points, one of which was the evolution of the medium of, uh, of broadcasting and, um, and how that's, uh, that's changed in terms of capacity to reach uh, the masses. So it started from, you know, from theater to the printing press, from the printing press to um, uh, all kinds of, uh, radio. to radio and radio to eventually television and the capacity for it to reach the masses. And so with that, I'd like to, whilst we're waiting for Luz to come online, she's already online, we're just waiting for the WebEx yeah. team. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Facebook uh, Director of Public Policy, Ms. Anki, your three minutes. Thank you, Sala. Uh, I think this is a very timely and important topic. The way we think about uh, this at Facebook is how do we mount a collective and a cohesive effort in terms of combating misinformation? That's how we think of it uh, at our company. And essentially, uh, we have a three-part framework 
which is focused on improving quality and authenticity of uh, news which gets circulated on our platform. So the three-prong test there is we remove content that violates our community standards. We are focused on reducing distribution of content that violates or undermines authenticity. Uh, we inform people about the news pieces which they are seeing by providing more context. So it's a combination of enforcement activities uh, on the platform as well as product innovation and product changes which, uh, help a which helps our community to understand what is what is fake news and what is authentic news. Um, if something gets flagged, we also work very actively with our partner community, which essentially are third party fact checkers who are experts, um, who are approved, who essentially work very closely and uh, are approved by Pointer, which as you all would know is an international certification body in terms of, of fact-checking. And we rely on our community of fact-checking partners to actively downrank news, which is fake news, which effectively means that you will not see distribution of that particular checkpointed fake news on our newsfeed. Uh, it essentially eliminate, reduces substantially 80% uh, of that type of distribution on the platform. We also feel that capacity building is a core component in terms of building awareness, in terms of this authenticity paradigm. And therefore, we are investing a lot of resources across countries worldwide to use traditional media to run public service education campaigns uh, it's a combination of print media ads as well as on-platform ads where we are highlighting what are the attributes of fake news so that people can teach themselves and then they can teach their community in terms of identifying what these attributes are and actively disengaging. Like there's a community level awareness of disengaging in terms of, um, uh, in terms of their, uh, the way they consume fake news or they distribute fake news. So, Ms. Anki, while you're there, uh, one of the questions uh, people may have is, is the fact that the, the publication about the, you know, the exposure in terms of the Cambridge Analytica saga, uh, would that have had an impact on Facebook increasing its social responsibility in terms of uh, uh, clamping down on fake news and misinformation? Thanks for that question, Sala. Uh, we are learning a lot from our experiences and taking that input in terms of our enforcement efforts as well as how we are looking at our, our integrity efforts in terms of making sure that we are making the right kind of product adjustments. Uh, the way our APIs are accessed by third-party developers, also having a big push in terms of transparency, particularly ads transparency, insofar as elections is concerned, where people can see who are the groups who are running a particular type of advertising. That is something which you can see on the ads dash dashboard. So we feel that more tr transparency is there in terms of making this information available, both in terms of ads as well as taking a lot of this input in terms of our enforcement function will help uh, clamp down severely on distribution of fake news. And uh, just very quickly, in 30 seconds, how much of it is self-regulation and how much of it is regulation from, uh, I noticed that the European Commission recently we're talking about the regulation of fake news and that sort of thing. So what's your, what is Facebook's take on uh, self-regulation and regulation? So this is, uh, like we say, that, that this is an ecosystem responsibility, right? Like, uh, of course, there is, we are at the core of it, we are a tech platform. So we will take appropriate measures to make sure that we are looking at enforcement in a very deep way. But there's also an equal amount of load sharing which needs to be done by the community, which essentially is both consumers as well as producers of news. We think that as we enhance capacities as a community, uh, this 
even if you regulate, you will regulate for today. You can't really regulate for tomorrow because it's such a, it's such a moving target in terms of technology evolution. So we believe that self-regulation, working with community models would be the best way to make progress on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Anki. So with that, if we could get uh, Professor Luz Nagel. Thank you, Luz. Could you, in three minutes, uh, sort of give us a high-level uh, summary of your take on the public policy issues, and we'll get back to you after the three minutes. Thank you, Luz. Hi, Salah. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, Luz. The room can see you, and we can all hear you fine. Please go ahead. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me um, uh, this way. Um, let me just... Um, um, emphasize uh, the role of the media. We got to remember that the media is the fourth pillar of democracy and the role of the media is vital for any democracy. The media is supposed to be uh, safeguarding transparency of uh, a democratic process. And uh, the media is to supply political information is to identify any problems that exist in the society. It is supposed to be also um, the, the, the way for everyone to have um, healthy discussions. Uh, one of the things that we, we, we see is the erosion of uh, the faith in the media. And I think that that has taken place um, in, in great part because the fast pace that we have had uh, with the media has um, triggered um, in, in, in a lot of the mediums to try to, to be the first ones on publicizing any type of information. So when the media makes mistakes, uh, sometimes those mistakes go unfixed. And that has caused a lot of faith on the media. So that is a big problem um, that we have. And on top of that, we have all this social media that has been uh, triggering a lot of this dissemination of misinformation and mistakes. So I, I think that we have um, um, a, 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 a lot of things to, to look into. Um, adding to that, um, it seems that there is a type of censorship in the media that comes from um, the, the, the companies that pay for um, ads or the, the companies that are in charge of the media. So in a way, those companies kind of um, impose certain type of censor in what the media can say or how the media says certain things. Thank you, Luz. We'll get back to you. We've just had a brief uh, technology disruption. So whilst, whilst we're there, if I could get um, Shaimla, Shmaila, to please, um, briefly relay the uh, assault on, uh, on media as far as the Pakistani uh, situation is. And Luz will be coming back to you. We have a few questions for you, Luz, after this. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I think in terms of the landscape regarding media and the sort of new issues that technology has um, brought to the fore, they, we sort of vacillate in our discussion between either over-regulation or under-regulation. And uh, in terms of, in order to, I'd just like to contextualize sort of what we mean by freedom of expression. Um, a lot of times uh, we have these I this idealized version of what freedom of expression should be, which is encapsulated in a lot of these international agreements uh, that we see. But um, on the ground, for example, in terms of a lived reality of what um, freedom of expression is, um, there's 
A, how it's practiced uh, sort of in daily life, and then the juridical concept as it exists. And in a lot of societies, even that sort of idealized juridical concept, for example, the constitutional uh, sort of framing of freedom of expression in the Pakistani context, for instance, is quite limited. So even the language of the constitution itself and the parameters that it um, uh, draws for media includes phrases like um, anything that goes against the glory of Islam or against national interest, um, those are the parameters within from sort of like the starting point that we have. So a lot of that framing from the very start is very restrictive. And then that is sort of compounded by a lot of legislation that we see, in, um, especially of late regarding social media, but generally of electronic media and news media. So there's that sort of um, a legal sort of touchstone that we usually see as that sanctified uh, space. Uh, but then how freedom of expression plays out in everyday life, there are obviously inequalities and um, political realities, which mean, for example, certain state actors like the military, for example, would um, bypass even the a very restrictive sort of ju uh, juridical concept of freedom of expression to sort of force uh, um, a, a certain narrative or a point of view. So in terms of when we, in that sort of environment, we sort of, where even the concept of truth is so heavily regulated um, for a very long time, um, and now I think the sort of uh, the West is coming around to this concept. Uh, it almost doesn't mean anything. It's so uh, used um, uh, of post-truth. But even in a very he heavily regulated societies, there's a lot of, for a very long time, a lot of speculation, a lot of reliance on rumors. So fake news isn't a very a new concept to that extent. And we see when um, in terms of the media and how that plays out, uh, f fake news and the sort of, uh, now the sort of pan moral panic that we see around fake news is often sometimes weaponized uh, to uh, clamp down on the media. Uh, and um, it, the phrase is often thrown around by powerful actors to also um, uh, enact new types of censorship. So um, that sort of, uh, while it is, it does have a lot of consequences and we see that it has a lot of consequences for minority groups, it translates, we've seen that it's translated into riots and violence um, uh, for minority, religious minority groups uh, uh, in the Pakistani context. It, that part is usually uh, left unregulated. And in terms of sort of political news, that is where fake news is sort of playing out and uh, that, uh, that discussion is continuously happening. Yeah. Thank you, Shmala. So Shmala raised some uh, very interesting points uh, in terms of the parameters of freedom of expression and the restrictions within, much of which is uh, enshrined within the Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with the three exceptions and a lot of it is known to the global community. But one of the things she, she pointed out that I'd like to just uh, ask her is the, the the statistics on uh, journalists who go missing in Pakistan. If you could just briefly comment on it for say 30 seconds before we get the next speaker. Um, so in the past, I think two years, um, there are over uh, 150 um, sort of activists and journalists who've been uh, sort of speaking truth to power have been um, uh, involved in what we call as enforced disappearances. And um, that is basically sort of a euphemism for the state picking up um, activists and journalists who um, are sort of not towing the narrative and the state. Uh, and that's sort of a very violent uh, demonstration of uh, the clampdown on freedom of expression. Thank you, Shmaila. We'd like to bring Luz back on, please. Luz, can you hear me? Yes, Al, I can hear you. While you were speaking, you mentioned uh, points in, in terms of the media makes mistakes. So we'd like to explore the, um, the two extremes of uh, the media being um, uh, persecuted as, and also in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of media making mistakes and whether the concept of whether the media should be responsible, whether that's a legitimate expectation and the irresponsibility of media. And in the context of the U.S., could you please speak to us about uh, the context of the United States? Thank you, Luz. Before we go to Dr. Yik Chen, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Hala. Sala. Um, uh, the media, it, just like like any other um, way of uh, expressing, um, yes, they made mistakes. Um, it, it may be mistakes of fact, or maybe just uh, um, because the, usually there is a lot of competition. So the media is competing for being the first one to put out any type of information. So when the media puts out information that is mistaken, um, they, they often um, a, a try to, to, to uh, fix it. But when the fix is done, um, sometimes is either very small or sometimes um, they, they don't fix it at all. So that brings about the loss of faith on the media. So that is one of the problems that we seem to be facing. And I think that that has allowed the labeling of fake news uh, to be so broadened, um, to include when the media makes mistakes. Um, so we are in such a heated environment here in the United States that any type of mistake is presumed to be intentional. And that presumption of intentional mistake um, pretty much is being affecting a lot of the free debate that we ought to be having. Um, so we start labeling each other, um, fake news, fake media, fake information, and that per se, has created this these animosity in the society. Um, so we also have um, a lot of irresponsible leaders and ignorant public that tend to just see anything and everything um, in ways that they either enhance or that they manipulate for their own purpose. And everything is being seen in light of one's own political point of view. That's and very that interesting, Luz. And enhance more what the, the, the environment in which we are here in the United States. Um, so we, we, uh, what I perceive is we are having a democratic erosion um, just because we are not having a healthy debate on anything. And once again, it comes from how the media seems to be rushing and competing for putting out the information. It seems that money now is the one that is ruling the environment. Why? Because it has become about ratings. Um, so you could have CNN competing with Fox or Fox competing with CNN for ratings. So each one is trying to put out the information or is trying to rush the information without checking properly the facts. Thank and you, Liz. That trying to gain some type of... Uh, um, uh, notoriety and being the first ones uh, putting out the news and being the ones that pretty much have the most amount of ratings um, has made these um, this, um, media pretty much uh, uh Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luz. And, and you raised some um, very interesting uh, points, which is critical Hello. to... Yes, we can hear you, Luz. We'll get back to you. We just need to pause for a moment and, and sort of um, reflect on some of the things that you mentioned, the capacity for media to be bought or uh, biases or opinions that it may have in terms of the capacity to influence or sway uh, how the public feels, whether it's consumerism or whether it's uh, political beliefs or whether it's movements. So with that, we'd like to explore another, another, uh, another geographical perspective 
a perspective from China. So please, Dr. Yi Chen Ching. Okay, thanks for uh, inviting me to join the panel. Okay, actually, I think uh, the media, actually, no matter in which part of the uh, society, no matter in Europe or in USA or in China, actually has a facing the uh, similar problems. I think there's three challenges uh, the media, uh, traditional media, or the responsible journalism are facing. The first one is the political issues, you know. Uh, as we know that in the US, we have this post-truth kind of claim. And in Asia, for example, in Hong Kong, I was teaching there for a couple of years. So the journalist uh, is talking about uh, advocacy uh, journalist advocate some positions instead of to be neutral uh, objective, which is the core value of the public service media you know, in Europe. So I think that is a political challenge. Uh, what is the role of the journalism? What is the role of the media? No matter in what part of the world. Second issue I'm thinking is about uh, financial uh, stability or sustainability of the media. Because of the new technology, uh, which is uh, uh, actually uh, shared a lot of the re revenue from the traditional media to the new media, you know. So which actually caused a lot of the financial dif difficulties for traditional media. For example, in China, a lot of newspaper, quality newspaper, was closing, not closing down, maybe merged because of the financial uh, uh, difficulties. And uh, also in other parts of the world, we witnessed a similar situation. For example, BBC you know, also has a question about the legitimacy of the public funding. The third one is a technological challenge. Uh, how the new media or the traditional media uh, cope with, like, uh, as I said, artificial intelligence or the citizen journalism. So for me, I think that, uh, in order for us to have a, a quality journalism, there's some necessary uh, policy environment, which we call, we call it an enabling policy environment. So I just want to point out some of these important policy uh, environment. For example, the first one I think is to, we need to minimize the political interference to the media, okay? That is the basic agreement across the different society, even in China. And the second one I think is uh, we need to have a, a, a kind of fair playing field we're talking about uh, not only the traditional media, but also the new media, the platform, the big platform, like a Facebook, uh, Tencent in China, or the Google, you know. Uh, for example, the molipini of the big platform has posed a significant uh, challenge for the traditional media, and also for the uh, diversity of the voice. And secondly, uh, thirdly, I think it's about the financial. How do we make the uh, quality news media to be financial, uh, stable, and the sustainability? For example, decline of the revenue, and third one is the technology uh, challenge. And the last, I think is most important, is how do we keep all these forced, cultivate the, the talent, the journalist. Uh, for example, in, in Asia, for, in Hong Kong, the statistics shows that 80% of the uh, journalist students, like in my school, you know, when they graduate, uh, after they work for the uh, news media for five years, they will move to the PR company. Why is that? Because the salary is, is very low, you know. So we need, also this happened in China as well, the loss of the good quality of the journalists, the talent. How do we cultivate those talents is also important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yik. With that, we'd like to open the floor to remote participants and anyone in the room. Would you like to weigh in at this stage of the discussions? before the panel goes for the second round. Yes, I can see somebody at the back. Please state your uh, first name, your surname, the country and organization you're from, and then please make your remarks. Renata Aquino Ribeiro, I am from Brazil. I'm a civil society MAG member, and I work with an NGO in education and technology, education, media, and technology. I related very much to the comments of the panelists from China because Brazil newspapers are always struggling uh, with economic difficulties, but most of all, um, it worries me very much that a way to circumvent uh, 
those economic difficulties that the newspapers are going through is to uh, relate themselves to the fake news media. And so a lot of newspapers have really dissolved into commentary uh, based on uh, actually led on by the internet. So uh, I wonder if liabilities apply or, uh, and I mean, Brazil is, is much less strict when it comes to publications, I believe, than China, but I wonder if uh, there were uh, responsibilities uh, called from publishers who prefer to publish internet rumors than uh, real news. So thank you, Hanata. You, your questions uh, hit to the heart of the public policy issues that uh, we've put in our working document. For those of you who've accessed the uh, program and the interactive uh, calendar, you'll see that there is also a live document. And the Twitter feeds, the Twitter hashtags are IGF2018, hashtag IGF2018, and hashtag main session. So if you have any thoughts on any aspect and you want to tweet, please feel free, because we'll be uh, creating a story file and a storyboard and uh, working all the comments into the working document. So this session, even after it expires, will result in a, a living working document that will be uh, sent uh, throughout the globe for further uh, substantive contributions. Uh, for the sake of time, if we could ask uh, other people who want to comment to please uh, make brief uh, remarks. Say, try to keep it within a minute. Um, uh, is there anyone who wants to comment uh, Amadou, Mamadou? Yes, I can see a hand right at the back. Yes, yeah. I'm Mamadou Lo, MAG member from the private sector. Online moderator of this session. I have no question right now on the, moderate, on the moderation up. But I have on one, a question on my own. I would like to know how our panelists see the rise of online hate speech and online extremism. I think that it is with fake news and disinformation one of the major issues our world is facing right now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mamadou. I see another hand right at the back. I can't see you, sir, to call out your name, but please introduce yourself and make your point. So, uh, hello, uh, thank you. I'm Julian Rossi from the University of Technology of Compiègne. I have a question regarding uh, the, this whole question of regulation of the um, circulation, um, dissemination of news on platforms. Um, it's related to basically uh, when you're trying to limit the organic reach of certain news on platforms like Facebook, you're using certain algorithms. Um, how transparent are these algorithms? Uh, is it possible for citizens to understand why uh, content um, dissemination is being limited, how it is limited? But also what is the legitimacy actually of such um, you know, type of new artificial intelligence censorship in a way, at least it could be perceived like that also by the groups, you know, that are using it, like perhaps uh, censoring uh, some news on, on and limiting the reach of some news could be also seen as a way to legitimize that news because some people will perceive it as, you know, they're trying to censor us, so. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think the point's well made, and I think it hits to the issue of legitimacy and the uh, transparency of the algorithm, and that's something uh, Anki could uh, uh, respond to. But before we do that, we'd like to take three more uh, interventions from the floor. Now, please understand that because of brevity of time, we'd like to ask you to strictly keep it to one minute or less. And if you go beyond the one minute, I'll call you on it, because we'd like the panel to then respond. Does anyone else? Yes, I see a gentleman over there, and two over here. Yes, please, could I take the two in the front, and then I'll get back to you, sir. Yes, please. Uh, we can't hear you. You need to speak loud. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I'm from Hong Kong, representing a YMCA of Hong Kong. So I would like to ask, because like sometimes fake news is about how the journalists interpret the news, but not about like governmental uh, intervention and political issue. So um, how should journalists actually uh, interpret the news in a more objective way and um, to organize the facts into objective news to let people know, like, without their subjective feelings and other comments. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Did you have a comment as well? Go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Bella, and I'm also from Hong Kong. And uh, you have mentioned some acts that can be done by organizations or citizens. Uh, but as those fake news are very hard to spot, and there is still some unable to identify. And when those fake news are spread, and maybe uh, because the internet is very fast, so it's hard to, very, uh, it's hard to stop those fake news. So um, what can the government actually can do to regulate these fake news? And as implementing like those legal ban or registration is a hard measure, which is more effective uh, when dealing with fake news. So uh, do you think that is possible if we can trust the government instead? Or uh, would there be a bigger possibility that the government itself can actually produce fake news? And also- um, Intervention is noted. Please keep it under one minute. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But I must say, very impressed with the youth participation from Hong Kong, and I think it deserves a round of applause from everybody. That's youth participation for you. But for the sake of time, because there'll be a security sweep, we're trying to um, shorten the intervention so that we can have a, a robust dialogue. The gentleman in the middle, please. Yes, my name is Wesley Gibbings from Trinidad and Tobago with the Association of Caribbean Media Workers. I think that our experience in, in my region has been that governments with respect to public policy are improvising and making things up as they go along and that what has been happening is that they've tended to err on the side of prohibition as opposed to erring on the side of freedom. So I just wanted to get some perspectives from the panel on that. Thank you. And that leads us to um, uh, Professor Russia, if we could weigh in from the Egyptian experience. Thank you, Salah. There's um, been quite a few interesting uh, points made from, from the floor. And basically, uh, I'll try to synthesize some, and it has to do with, you know, uh, hate speech. How do, we, how do we regulate hate speech? How do we regulate, period? You know, should Facebook be regulating through their algorithms? Should the government be regulating? Uh, Pink Floyd's famous question, mother, should I trust the government? And the answer is no. A big fat no. All governments all across the world, uh, not just in one region. Um, I think that's opening the door to um, a lot of trouble. Um, I think governments would love for us to say, you know, we have a problem of fake news, please solve it for us. And the answer is very simple. The answer is censorship. Um, and I don't like that just as much as I don't like Facebook censoring anything uh, in the face of, in the name of, you know, protecting us from fake news. Because who, who is making the judgment and based on what? Uh, that's, these are questions that, that we need to be asking ourselves. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that anybody has bad intentions, but, you know, corporations, just as governments, are after their own interests. And if the interests of the user, um, uh, if, there's, if there's a, a conflict of interest between the user and the, and the corporation or the government, guess who's going to win? Uh, those in control. And not that we have much to do about that, actually, <laughs> other than talk about it, you know, and, and raise our voices. Uh, because that, that goes down a very um, dangerous road um, a road of a road of censorship, a road of in, in some in some uh, parts of the world um, also penalizing those who journalists or social media users uh, who post in online in the name of um, uh, posting hate hate um, uh, speech or in the name of uh, tarnishing the reputation of a country or a government or a religion or. Uh, some some sacred entity of, of some sort, uh, and and that takes us down uh, down a very bad route. Uh, people making decisions for us, people telling us what is what is hate uh, speech and and what is fake news. Professor what, Russia. what happens to be fake and what happens to be true. That's very dangerous. So, Professor Russia, you raise a very interesting point uh, at this juncture, and I thought I should um, ask the question. Given the exceptions uh, within the article, given the exceptions within art, art, Article 19 of the ICCPR, uh, in terms of the exceptions to freedom of expression under international law, 
noting that not all countries have ratified the ICCPR, so it doesn't um, apply to all countries. There, there are countries who haven't ratified the ICCPR. And the exceptions are public morality, hate speech, xenophobia, and national security. So with that, I'd like to ask you just very briefly in 30 seconds, um, what's your perception of governments or, or states or countries, national states, who may have codified these exceptions uh, within their constitutions or within their legislative uh, instruments? So 30 seconds, uh, Professor Russia, before I give it to uh, Luz Nagel. Again, I think the danger is that those in power tend to define things to their own interests. So they will define what is hate speech for us and they will define what is national security for us. Uh, I, at this point in, in some parts of the world, I don't see much that we can do about it other than talk about it. In other parts of the world, people can actually do something and I, in, in these parts of the world where you can do something, please do something before that kind of freedom is gone. Um, it's, it's a dangerous thing. I think education is the key. That's the only thing that we can be doing right now is to educate ourselves, educate our families, our friends, our students, our whoever, just you know, spread self-awareness, spread uh, good educational messages, teach people how to uh, differentiate between um, uh, facts and opinion basically is the answer to your question. How do journalists separate, you know, separate uh, their opinions from the story? Teach people how to separate fact from opinion. You'd be surprised how many, you know, adults with university education cannot cannot separate a fact from a piece of opinion. That's you know that's something that we can and need to work on. I think. Thank you, Pro Professor Russia. Just before I get you on board, Luz, I'll just ask um, Giacomo Mazzone to make a quick intervention before we get Luz on. I realize it's very early in the morning in Miami, Luz. Apologies. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, first, uh, a methodology suggestion of this about the use of the words. I, um, in Europe, we have discussed very much about that and we don't like the use of fake news. Fake news is just a part of a larger phenomenon that we call, we prefer to call information disorder, where there are many, many components. If you, you go into the fake news debate, you risk to be trapped in uh, I don't like what you said, so this is fake news, et cetera, et cetera. This is um, not a rational way to approach the debate. Um, about the re regulation or legislation, et cetera, for me, this is a personal opinion, we have to go to regulation. I don't believe that self-regulation is enough for a very simple reason. The business model of the internet platforms uh, is uh, tends to make money out of having the maximum number of um, people, the maximum number of accounts on Twitter, the maximum number of everything. So if, despite that they are fake or not, the, even if they are fake, you make money. And so th there is a problem in the economic model that for me, it's incompatible with the search of the truth as we suppose is, has to be media, traditional media and, and journalism. The, the, the long-term solution, as Russia said correctly, is a question of enhance the people to understand. Uh, when um, many politicians go to Twitter, they go to Twitter simply because they don't want to have contradictory. They don't want to talk with the journalists that could raise hard questions to them. They don't want to talk, so they send a tweet. Then the journalist is trapped in this digital era. In, uh, I report about that even if I cannot raise questions because this message raises a lot of questions, but I cannot raise the question or I don't report and then the people say I'm, I'm censoring or I'm not um, covering that event. So we are in a trap that only through, when the, when the citizen under, will understand that this is a shortcut not to answer to the nasty question and to, so to let the journalists do the watchdog uh, work, uh, on, only un until that day will be very difficult to solve the issue. Thank you, Giacomo. Before we go to um, Anki, who will weigh in on the APIs and um, relationships with third-party vendors and algorithms as was posed by the interventions from the floor, I'd like to invite Luz to please weigh in for two minutes. You have two minutes, Luz, go ahead. 
I, can you hear me? We can hear you loud Sorry, and clear, please continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that um, we need to add to the debate the role of corporations in the media, because at least here in the United States, corporations have a lot of influence on how the news are perceived and what type of news get put out. And we know that there are very few corporations who are in charge of the media. I do agree uh, with one of the speakers that it is crucial to educate the people because lack of education facilitates more manipulation of the citizens in the way that they can perceive the information that is presented to them. And it also goes to this label that we have given to maybe misinformation or, or half information as fake news. If we were to educate citizens so that they could differentiate between facts and opinions and manipulation, I think that that will be very helpful. But going back to the role of money and corporations and media, I think that that is something that we all ought to think about when we try to look at policy aspects. Um, because again, it has become all about making money. And all of you have seen what has happened in the United States. Uh, when we have all these political debates, it's about entertaining people. It doesn't seem that the reporting is serious. It has become entertainment. Everything has become a show. So why the entertainment? Why the show? Because people seem to be wanted to be entertained. And we need to bring back the role of the media as the fourth pillar of democracy. So I, I think that that will be something important that we ought to take into consideration. Thank you, Professor Luz. We really appreciate your streaming in this uh, early in the morning. I recognize you've been up since 1 a.m. It's probably 6 a.m. in Miami. So we really appreciate your, your participation and your contribution. So with that, I'd like to ask Anki if she could weigh in for two minutes before I ask Shmaila uh, to give her interventions. So one, um, in order to, I think there were multiple themes in the questions which came across. I'll try and respond, unpack it one by one. Oh, yeah, and of course, try and make it within your two minute deadline. Um, one particular factor which is very important to uh, you know sort of acknowledge and understand is many a times fake new fake accounts are behind fake news circulation and uh, you have to act against fake accounts because then there is an accountability problem you just don't know who these fake it is a huge quality uh, issue in terms of the news which is getting circulated by these uh, spammers, essentially the spam operations. And you, there is no way that this, this can stay on the platform. And we act against them because if you don't disrupt such networks, there is going to be very limited success in terms of combating fake news at, on the platform at scale. And um, therefore, we've made a huge focus in terms of fighting, fighting against fake accounts and sort of taking them off the platform very rapidly because that does disrupt both economic incentives for, uh, for uh, spammers. Second thing point which I think was raised was broadly a point about transparency. And I would like to respond to it in two ways. One is that we have made our um, policies in terms of uh, third-party developers, how they build on Facebook, how they access our API transparent, and this is now listed on our website in fairly great detail in terms of what those policies are. Uh, the second element is that anyone can now view 
ads on Facebook. Like you can go and see uh, page ads and essentially see what those ads are, who are these people who are running these ads, etc. And that also helps in addressing the legitimacy concern because a lot of that also was what we've seen in the previous, in the previous uh, era when fake news was circulating on the platform and there was no real strategy to combat it, that there was misuse of ads and also there was uh, existence of fake accounts in the platform. It was a combination of these two fundamentally which was leading to a lot of viral spread of fake news. And that's something which, which we dealt with uh, on the Facebook side. On the WhatsApp side, and this again is something which is very true in the region which I represent, and what we've done in India is that we've introduced a limitation on the forward feature on WhatsApp, limited it to five forwards to stop, you know, sort of bad viral spread of fake news, which can cause real world harm in terms of violence and rioting, et cetera. And that has proved to be fairly effective in combating viral spread of fake news. So we'll have to look at technical measures, transparency, as well as capacity building. And we think that can be done through public, sec uh, public service education campaigns and also partnering with real experts in the field, including news organizations. It's wonderful, Anki. Um, those are comments by uh, Facebook Public uh, Policy Director, Ms. Anki. So with that, I'd like to ask Shmaila to weigh in for two minutes. Um, so broadly, I think um, we've been discussing the issue of regulation and sort of uh, along the spectrum where we should lie. And it's important to ask when we talk about regulation, who is doing the regulation? And um, first of all, there's we see this trend of, of the uh, this real privatization of the sort of um, determinations of what is speech, what should be uh, legitimate speech, because we have a lot of uh, governments working with social media companies and making these determinations, not along lines of sort of constitutional limits, along lines of legislative limits, but sort of within these privatized developed rules, which are not sort of compatible with the larger framework of democracy. So, um, what, uh, 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 our remote uh, panelist was talking about the role of corporations, and it's it's a very real role which leads to decision making regarding regulation. And the second one is the sort of in the traditional model, the regulation regarding speech is being done by the state. Um, and it's important to remember that the state is not an apolitical entity, and it, it determinations of what should be considered legitimate speech are then recited by um, sort of national interest. And that is a very old question that we sort of have to deal with. And um, the, uh, there is uh, this sort of, uh, I think time and time again, uh, these like clear red line rules um, have failed in terms of sort of questions regarding uh, that sort of are outlier questions regarding uh, hate speech and um, fake news. And I would like to agree with sort of my panelists and um, education, uh, ed education based campaigns are, uh, are very important. And we, sh we should also be focusing on sort of developing and strengthening a counter speech um, regarding um, when it comes to hate speech. And there's been a lot of work regarding that. And that does need institutional support as well, not just sort of, uh, because even in terms of hate speech, there is a power imbalance in terms of uh, those who are producing the hate speech and then uh, the counter speech, which are usually uh, individuals and uh, citizens. Thank you, Shmaila. With that, I'd like to ask Dr. Yik Chen for two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I agree with my panelists about uh, whether self-regulation is sufficient. Uh, from my point of view, I do not think uh, self-regulation is sufficient for various reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, actually, uh, for example, the fake news in China, for example, many, many fake news actually was financially motivated. People use artificial intelligence you know, to generate uh, fake news in order to make making profit out of it. So I'm out of the whether self-regulation is sufficient. So, and I think from my point of view, I think uh, 
uh, to tackle these fake news issues, we need a kind of a co-regulation, maybe multi-stakeholder approach governance, you know, involve uh, platform, uh, news, uh, news organization, traditional news organization and platforms and the government, because the government actually contribute to the fake news in China, because there are lack of the efficient response. Once there's a rumors spread online, but they could also play an important role, you know, to facilitate the refutal of the fake news. So in China, I think there's a kind of policy. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to finish that comment? In China, there's a kind of policy? Yes, uh, uh, in China, there's some policy regarding how to regulate the, 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 the fake news. For example, such as they have a criminal law, you know, which I think is may not be necessary to have a criminal law. And they have licensing uh, for online news providers or online news provider has to have licensed in order to provide uh, news. And they, uh, the, the platform, of course, have an obligation, you know, to remove anything which is uh, defamatory and also request the uh, uh, the platform and ISP to collaborate with the uh, end user to tackle the fake news. I think there's a policy control on this, but as I said, this is open to dispute or discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yik Chen. So with that, please allow me to ask the remote moderator. Are there any comments online? No, Salah, we have no comment. Okay, Thank no. you. Okay. Is there anyone who has a burning uh, comment to make from the floor? It's obvious from the panel that they, oh yes, I see one hand. Please introduce yourself. And uh, one minute intervention, please. Thank you. Спасибо, Леонид Левин, Россия, Российский парламент. Я хотел бы тоже поддержать выступающих, которые говорили о том, что недостаточно саморегулирования, потому что саморегулированием занимаются крупные корпорации, которые владеют медиа и социальными сетями, которые сами определяют единые принципы и не учитывают специфику той или иной страны, а это крайне важно. И говоря о фейк news, также хотелось бы добавить, что не надо изобретать велосипеды в регулировании этой сферы. Есть общие принципы, по которым сегодня уже работают и интегрируются крупные международные компании и поисковые системы. Это алгоритмы. Речь идет о том, что в первую очередь определяются компании, которые крайне популярны, которые имеют большое количество подписчиков, а в социальных сетях это речь идет о большом количестве репостов, и именно они рекомендуются в первую очередь для тех, кто выбирает тот или иной сайт, ту, ту или иную страницу. Я думаю, что эти принципы надо учитывать при формировании и борьбы с фейк-ньюсами. А если говорить о борьбе с фейк-ньюсами, надо бороться в первую очередь с теми, кто их распространяет изначально, то есть там, где это появляется. Спасибо. Thank you. That was a very excellent uh, intervention. I hope you were listening, uh, Luz. If I hope you saw the transcript for that uh, particular intervention. Uh, was sort of in line with uh, some of the things that you raised in terms of uh, putting the focus back on corporations and the capacity to monetize uh, content. And I note that in 2016, at an APEC officials uh, meeting, meeting in Vietnam, noting that the uh, APEC meeting is happening in Papua New Guinea right now, that's probably why the president of China is not in Paris for the Paris Peace Forum, because he's there, I think he's there. Anyway. Um, it was said that $1.9 billion, uh, was it $1.9 trillion or billion in terms of global e-commerce sales? And what would be interesting is what component of that is actually media and content and, and that sort of thing. And, the capacity, and it's a very interesting intervention by the gentleman uh, in terms of um, uh, his take on regulation. Uh, and you notice that the panel had... Uh, uh, quite a diverse view on uh, capacity to regulate and not regulate, self-regulate, not regulate. And there have been uh, intermittent questions and interventions from the floor in terms of transparency of algorithms. And I note that the last uh, intervention from the floor also said that, that look, there are common principles that exist. So that's one of the things we'd like to invite you to do is to uh, contribute to the living document that's online at, on the IGF website. If you have any views or perspectives on the, those particular instances, to, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. And whether there's room for potential intercessional 
potential best practice forum, particularly in this particular uh, uh, thematic, uh, sub-thematic area. So with that, is there any other intervention from the floor? I see one hand up, two hands up, please. Go for it, keep it to a minute, thank you. Yes, sir, and after that, madam. Yeah. Uh, just a question. I was hearing the intervention from China. Uh, what worries me what worries me is what is the point that if you are trying to fight fake news, actually you are curtailing freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Because in many countries, uh, and mine was one of those, uh, the government was the main spreader of fake news. And uh, journalist investigations that were, were funded, were, were fundamented with a lot of document uh, to back what they were saying, were uh, labeled by the government as fake news. So it worries me these kinds of, uh, of limitations. I know that fake news is a problem. I believe in education, but Thank I'm you. worried Thank about you, censorship. Madam. You have one, yes, I think. The point is well noted. If you heard the, the panelists from China, she mentioned that uh, she, would, she was encouraging less restriction on... Uh, uh, yes, sorry, I'll, uh, let um, you, I'll let you answer, Dr. Yeah. Yi, for 30 seconds before we go to the next. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to, for this to answer this question. I think that's an excellent question. Actually, yeah, as you said, you know, the Chinese government actually restricted freedom of expression, and that's, that's why I said you know, the government contribute to the spread of the fake news, as well as they have a role to play in uh, rebuttal the, the fake news. Uh, one of the reasons, as, as you said, you know, uh, sometimes why the fake news was uh, widely spread in China is because of the distrust of the government. And, but at the same time, you know, many fake news is not necessarily political related, maybe it's other social issue, economical issue, so therefore, you know, yeah, that's my point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yik. Gentleman from, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Arseny Nidak. I'm from the Russian Federation governmental sector. Um, we heard from the panelists earlier that um, one of the main cause of the fake news or informational disorder, or whatever it's called, is uh, an irresponsible media and irresponsible pu uh, public actions. So um, the question is maybe it's time to draw a line between professional journalists and so-called new media actors and not mixing them uh, up, uh, you know, as, as some regulation are trying to impose now, uh, for example, in Council of Europe or some uh, international organizations, uh, and to impose some transparent international framework for these new media actors, because traditional media, I mean professional media, they already have this legal network in, the, in, 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 in their home na na nationals. And uh, the second thing that I just wanted to mention, we already had a question about the extremism, uh, the first one, and it was left without answer. Thank you. So just a, a very quick uh, point, and it's a counter question which is what happens to countries where all the traditional media outlets are captured by the state and you have individual uh, journalists who sort of um, act in the, in, in the role of the, what the traditional media is supposed to be. So that, that's something to think about. And I note that you mentioned that you felt that one question left, uh, was left unanswered. Would you like to repeat the question? I haven't asked the, the, the counter extremism. It was, it was the first one. Okay, so Giacomo, would you like to um, give our concluding remarks before we officially wrap up this session? Very difficult to conclude all this debate so so vast. <coughs> but <coughs> just to answer to, to what has been said, we have already um, definition. At, we are at UNESCO. UNESCO has defined what is uh, media professionals, media practitioner, and um, the protection extend to all these forms of media practitioners. So. Uh, if you want, I can share with you this information. Council of Europe also has, but is less defined than the one at UNESCO. 
And I think that we need to stick to that because there are situations in which the traditional media roles has been played out by other non-traditional media because uh, the, the traditional ones are under control. Um, about extremism um, and in general, I think that, again, we need to come uh, to a regulation. We need to, um, to make this regulation not only in case where there is a, a crime uh, already a crime that has been committed through uh, the media or through social media in, in this case, but also we need to find rules that reduce the risk to have this make possible. Today the system as it is, is uh, open a highway for those that want to trick the game and to cheat and to introduce extremist uh, views, hate speech, or even fake news to for simply for making money out of the, the stock exchange. Uh, we need to have responsibility of, of all the actors in order to reduce this risk down to an acceptable level, because we have this level before. What is different today is that uh, something like that could, in a second, reach millions and millions of viewers or, or readers everywhere. Is not the final answer, but it's a, a tentative of giving an answer. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to um, make plugins. The, the hate speech workshops at this IGF 2018, I think there are three, eight workshops 80, 81, and 83. The fake news workshops, there are four. Workshops 95, 161, 333, and 415. And there's a workshop on local content, 186. There's a living and working document that's uh, available online, and uh, the Twitter hashtags exist. So whilst we're concluding this panel, the document will still be live and um, your contributions are valid. And we'd like to invite particularly the youth participation from uh, YMCA in Hong Kong to invite you and your peers and all other youth uh, IGFs that are represented from Europe and Africa, Asia Pacific, uh, Latin America, and have I forgotten a region, Eastern Europe and Western Europe, to please uh, cross-pollinate the working document. With that, please allow me to thank the remarkable panelists, distinguished panelists who've given up their time to uh, contribute to a fascinating dialogue, but most especially to Professor Luz Nagel, who's uh, streaming in from Miami. Please uh, join me in giving them a hand. And also thank you to the remote moderators and those who are streaming on YouTube and Facebook. Please put your hands together. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude the media content main session. And if I could kindly ask you to please pack your things, we need to exit the room. The French police and the security forces will be sweeping the room to prepare it for the French president who will be opening the IGF. So with that, thank you very much. We're calling it a day. So to those of you who are streaming in uh, from the Pacific, from Latin America, Caribbean, from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, South America, from um, China and all across the world. We uh, thank you for streaming and we realize it's very late. We appreciate your participation. So with that, till next time, adieu.